Next, we'll introduce network storage systems. Organizations make use of two broad categories of computer storage for file databases and other data. The first category is local storage, commonly called direct access storage. It is dedicated digital storage devices that are attached directly to the server or PC. Most users' computers and most servers have direct access storage. The second category is network storage. It is a storage device that is available over a network and maintains copies of the data across high-speed local area network connections. It is designed to back up file databases or other data to a central location that can be easily accessed through standard network tools and protocols. Let's watch a video that explains the two main forms of network storage. When it comes to network storage, we have a couple of different options. We have SAN or storage area network and NAS or network attached storage. So what's the difference between these two different technologies? Let's start with network attached storage and we'll diagram it this way. We'll put a switch here and then we'll put a server rack and connect it to the switch like this. Then we'll put out a couple of PCs and we'll connect them to the switch as well. The key thing with network attached storage is that it is attached to the same network as your clients and PCs, which means anybody can actually access it. Typically it's going to be on a network attached storage device and your servers and sometimes even your clients will access it using standard network protocols like NFS or SMB. The alternative to NFS is a SAN or a storage area network. Now with a storage area network, we have one network that is dedicated to our clients and our servers. And then we're going to have a second network that is dedicated to our servers and our storage devices. The servers will be able to use this uh, network to access these storage devices. The clients can only access them through the server. So the clients request data from the server. The server uses a specialized network to go grab the data from the storage devices. These networks typically run with specialized technologies like fiber channel or iSCSI. So which one should you use? Well, that depends on your environment and what you're trying to accomplish. Both have their strengths and weaknesses, but hopefully now you have an idea of the differences so you can make the right choice. As introduced in the video, networked storage comes in two typologies. The first one is storage area network. A SAN is a dedicated network that provides access to various forms of storage devices, such as the array of hard disks and tapes. The second one is network attached storage, NANS. NANS is networked appliances that contain one or more hard devices that are shared with multiple heterogeneous computers. The standard of good practice recommends several security measures for computer storage systems. First, an organization should follow the system development and configuration security policies for design and configuration of network storage systems. Second, be sure that SANS and NANS are subject to standard security practices such as configuration, change management, and patch management. Third, ensure that IT facilities provides protection of network storage management consoles and administration interfaces. Fourth, store encrypted information on network storage systems. Finally, allow for additional security arrangements specific to NANS and SAN. Next, we're going to introduce service level agreement. A service level agreement refers to a contract between a service provider and its internal or external customers. It documents what services the provider furnishes. It also defines the performance standards that the provider is obligated to meet. A wide variety of service levels are used in a number of contexts. In general, there are three important types of service level agreements. There are network providers, computer security incident response team, and cloud service providers. A network LSA is a contract between a network provider and a customer. It defines specific aspects of the service to be provided. A network SLA typically includes information such as a de description of the nature of service to be provided, the expected performance level of the service, and the process for monitoring and reporting the service level. 
The figure here on this slide shows a typical configuration for a network SLA. A computer security incident response team, CSIRT, is an organization that receives reports of security breaches, performs analysis on these reports, and responds to the senders. An internal CSIRT is assembled as a part of a parent organization, such as a government, a corporation, or a research network. An external CSIRT provides paid services on either an ongoing or as-needed basis. CSIRT provides three main groups of services. The first one is reactive services, the CSIRT responses to incidents. These are the main sources of work for CSIRT. The second one is proactive services. CSIRT performs actions to prevent incidents from occurring in the future. The final one is security quality management services. It refers to the services that do not involve incidents, but rather include working with IT or other organization departments in which CSIRT member help solidify security systems. SLA for a cloud service provider includes security guarantees such as data confidentiality, integrity guarantees, and availability guarantees for cloud services and data. Several considerations for a cloud provider LSA is raised and they are listed here on this slide. Next, we are going to introduce performance and capacity management, which ensures that the IT capacity matches the current and future needs of the business. It also ensures the throughput and runtime requirements defined by the business are fulfilled. The critical success factors include understanding the current demands for IT resources and producing forecasts for future requirements. The success factors also include being able to plan and implement the appropriate IT capacity to match business needs and to demonstrate cost-effective interaction with other processes during the application lifecycle. Organizations need to implement capacity and performance management that is appropriate to them, which requires a process to periodically review current performance and capacity of the IT resources. This process includes forecasting future needs based on workload, storage, and contingency requirements. Capacity and performance management provides assurance that information resources supporting business requirements are continually available. Capacity and performance management should also include exception management where problems are identified and resolved before a user call in. Further, it should include quality of service management, where network administrators plan, manage, and identify individual service performance issues. Next, we're going to introduce backup. Backup is the process of making a copy of files and programs to facilitate recovery if necessary. The objective is to ensure the integrity and availability of information processed and stored with the information systems. The following list on this slide provides a useful set of policies to ensure effective backup. The National Institute of Standard and Technology Special Publication recommends a strategy for a backup and recovery that takes into account a risk assessment of the information to be stored and recovered. This table here on this slide summarizes the strategy. Three types of sites for backup are often defined as alternatives. Cold site is a backup facility that has the necessary electronical and physical components of a computer facility, but does not have a computer equipment in place. This site is ready to receive the necessary replacement computer equipment in the event that the user has to move to an alternative site. The warm site is an environmentally conditioned workspace that is partially equipped with information systems and telecommunications equipment to support relocation operations in the event of significant disruption. The hot site is fully operational off-site data processing facility that is equipped with hardware and software to be used in an event of an information system disruption. The choice of alternative site must be cost-effective and should match with the availability needs of the information systems. Next, we're going to talk about change management. According to COVID-5, change management is a discipline which ensures that system software, application software, 
and configuration files are introduced into the production in an orderly and controlled manner. Change management is critical for organizations and teams of various sizes and in various industries, including IT and manufacturing. It ensures that the standardized methods, processes, and procedures are used for all changes. It also facilitates efficient and prompt handling of changes. Furthermore, it maintains a proper balance between the need for change and the potential detrimental impact it can cause. ISO 27000 series suggests the following items to be considered in implementing change management, and they are listed here on this slide. Also, the following guidelines are useful in developing a change management strategy. They include dealing with communication maintenance window, change committee, and critical changes. They also covers planning the change, documenting change requests, and testing the change.